Finding extras was, was always a challenge on Lord of the Rings, a particular challenge when you get into horseback riding. Often we wanted riders that had their own horses, so I remember discovering at breakfast I thought I was surrounded by all these Rohan men, only to hear them start talking and realize that, in fact, these, were horse, these horse riders were a group of women who had gone through makeup and now were at having uh, porridge in their beards. And so you'd sit down and you really knew you were the traveling circus because you're there you're having breakfast with the bearded women. You've been in battle, your blood's up, your men of Rohan, even the bearded ladies are men of Rohan today. There are some very good women riders in New Zealand and it'd be silly not to take advantage of them. <laughs> really, I am a girl. I am. It's just not real, see? I'm a girl. <laughs> I mean, some of the women rode as well or better than any of the men, so... Um, but it could be... it could be, um... It could be confusing at times. I actually happen to know the story of Vigo becoming quite fond of a Rohan man <laughs> who turned out to be a woman. I can't, um honestly deny anything that that uh, Mr. Monaghan has said or implied. With a kind of strawberry blonde beard. And I always knew Vigo had good taste, you know. I mean, never go for the kind of dark brown beard, but strawberry blonde, something that really brings out her, her skin texture. Uh, but I am thankful that he showed a measure of discretion. She's a woman, so I get that out of her, but she's also bearded which means i can you know i kind of get a different kind of spin on things and uh gentlemanly uh restraint and that's fine you know vigo's an artist and he can do whatever he wants it's not really going to float my boat but i'm not going to say anything against him you just keep on trucking vigo i mean one could but perhaps shouldn't um delve into some of his uh <clears throat> Ah, oh, stranger episodes, but uh, perhaps I'll save that. That's great. He's going to kick the f*** out of me for that one. <coughs> Films live or die on their casting. Um, you know, if we, if we got Frodo wrong, if we cast the wrong actor as Frodo, imagine the disaster or the mess these films would be. And I mean, any of the actors could, in a way, kill a movie if they're the wrong actor. And the same was true of Gollum. We were basically meeting actors who could do good voice work because at that point we thought we were just looking for a voice actor. The, the original kind of way into the job was me getting a phone call from my agent saying, Andy, look, I don't know if you're interested, but they're doing this film, Lord of the Rings, down in, in New Zealand, and they want to see you for this CG character, to do a voice for a CG character, and it's probably about three weeks' work. And, and I was thinking to myself, well, you know, that sounds dull as hell, you know, I'm not interested in doing that, I'm an actor, I want to play, there must be a dozen good roles in that movie, you know. And then I started looking at the book and I thought, like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, this is just amazing, this character is the best written part in it. He came in and um, he did a really uh, memorable audition. He, he was just able to generate this weird voice. My cats at home had a big uh, Im impact on how um, Gollum's voice came about, because they get furballs in their throats after they lick so that the yeah, yeah, yeah. that that became um, that then became Gollum, Gollum. He was almost cast from the second that we met him. <laughs> and what was interesting is that in order to create the voice, he was having to distort himself and put all this expression in his face, and, and that's where he was finding the voice. He was actually doing the character. Take it off us! It hurts us! So listen to him, but he's trying to trick us. <laughs> And it was really in that audition that I came to realise something that never really occurred to me, and that the voice and the facial expressions and the energy are related. I mean, you can't separate the two. Peter became convinced that he would use him not just to do the voice, but really to become the personality, the motivating, kind of unifying performance behind Gollum would come from Andy.
Andy Circus. Hiya. He's playing a strange guy in tights. <laughs> that suit took a beating too, because I remember they made it and it was it was all kind of clean and pristine. And Andy, his approach was so intense and he gave absolutely everything every day and physically bashed himself about. So the suit was just screwed. He'd also, with the voice, he would give everything, and as a result, he'd be spitting and drooling. Oh, Where Sam's cooking the rabbits, and, uh, and Gollum's going, oh, and then he goes, and he spits. That's my gob of spit. It's mine, my own, my precious gob of spit, which comes out of my mouth, and it's like, yes, I am on screen. That's my saliva. I mean, he, he tore up his throat with that voice. Holy horses! Mustn't stop her! Come on! Hence the, the golem juice. We invented this, this, uh, this juice called golem juice, which was basically honey, lemon, and, uh, and ginger. And most of the time, I think it was warm. And he would sort of sip on that so that the golem voice wouldn't become ruined. Hey. It's a strong brew, so you can is put more, more okay. hot see, water in it to careful it's really hot. You see, I can't speak like Gollum until I've drunk this <laughs> special Gollum juice. And then afterwards... Careful it's hot. Yeah. I just don't like this, you see. Which is great, thank you very much. See you, Smeagol. You know, and I used to drink it by the bucket load, you know. I just used to, I used to have bottles of it and just... Every, in between every take, and I just, I just when my guts used to really ache from it. And he went to all of these extremes to make sure that this character came to life in the way that he saw it in his mind. And that's an incredible achievement. The Scaring of the Shire is, is basically, um, I don't know, 70 or 80 pages of story that happens after the ring is destroyed. They arrive home and surprise you, not with a happy ending, but with the fact that whilst they've been off saving the world, this evil has managed to infect their own home. So they think they've won, and then they go back and they find their whole homeland has been almost destroyed. And I think uh, Tolkien perhaps makes the point that, uh, that the Shire isn't invulnerable. It just thinks it is. But it too should actually bear some part of the, the pain and the casualties of Middle Earth. And this is where the real nature of evil is genuinely brought home to the reader because we never thought that the Shire could be spoiled. We did pay homage to it um, in the Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo looks into Gladriel's mirror, he sees exactly the imagery from the scouring of the Shire. He sees Hobbiton destroyed, he sees the, the line of Hobbit's chain. You see him see the sort of the Shire kind of become like a horrible, almost Holocaust factory kind of environment. So you have a, you sort of a, a tip of the hat to it there. Not say, do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. Well, I think we were all semi-dreading the Greyhaven sequence and also, you know, in, in a sick kind of way, looking forward to it, because as actors, to be crying all day and, and to be in a state is one of the ultimate places that you can go. A lot of people have said to me that that must have been, like, the final thing you shot with the Greyhavens, was you guys saying goodbye to each other. And it wasn't. It was right in the thick of principal photography, and we had to think, what have we been through? We hadn't been to Mordor and back, so even though my mind knew that, okay, we were gonna have this big experience, and this was after the big experience, it was a little, it was a little uncomfortable hoping that it would, it would hit the right emotional pitch. So we spent the whole day doing this scene, and basically in tears, like, for the whole day. And, you know, it just gives you a headache, and it's, it's really hard to get to that emotional pitch. It is time, Frodo. But I think it was also difficult because we could imagine ourselves having to say goodbye to each other, and that was a difficult thing to accept, and that made the scene all the more emotional. So when the end of the day came, although it was a great day, it was like, oh, thank God, that's over, you know, that's, you know, and we've got it, and that's great. Yeah, next next morning, morning we come in, and it turns out that Sean Astin, during dinner break, of the day of the Grey Havens, had been off to make a phone call or something and took his costume off. So when he came back, he forgot to put his waistcoat on, or vest, as you call it in the USA. And it didn't have the right vest on. Oh. <laughs> I didn't 
didn't have the right vest on. So we had to reshoot, we had to reshoot it. Can you believe that? That this scene that was just like so kind of emotional, but then you had to go back knowing what it was going to feel like filming another whole day of that. So it was like, oh. It was one of those moments where you felt that you captured magic and, and you didn't know whether you could ever do it again. We were just, we were just crushed. <laughs> we were just all so deflated. I remember the three other hobbits looked at me like, we will kill you, <laughs> you jerk. I mean, I felt so sorry for Sean Astin, but I was, I was part of the, the witch hunt that went on. He come on set and we were like, that's the way, are you sure that's the way it's cut? It's not a brown one, it's not a blue one. Cool, thank you. <clears throat> and then they got this, the negative back, and they got a call from the lab with, with the, the, the redo that we had done with the right vest on. We went and looked at the stuff and it was the most dispiriting thing because the majority of it was out of focus. I had the job of having to go to the hobbits the following morning and say, hey, I, I saw the footage last night. And of course, they're all going, yeah. And you know, they're wanting to hear how great it was. And I'm saying, um, we're going to have to shoot it again. It was out of focus. A and I could see this horrible moment on their faces where they thought I was joking. You know, it was one of those situations where I wished I was joking. I wished it was a joke because they were just going, uh huh. Oh, uh -huh, Peter, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, it was like Peter's trying to pull our leg again, and it was like, guys, I promise you I am not joking. This is absolutely serious. So we had to redo it again. <laughs> and then everybody was like, they were, they were double mad at me. Do you have the right vest on this time? Like, we don't have to do it a fourth time because... We, we got it again. We did manage to get it as good, fortunately, but it was just one of those kind of horrible moments. If you were to say to an actor, we will give you a guaranteed get out of jail free card if you want to choose one day where you never have to do that day again, I think all four of us would have said, Grey Havens, there's the irony, you know? That's the journey. That's how we earn our stripes, you know?